it's time to get sexy on Secular Sexuality. Well, hello and welcome to Secular Sexuality. My name is Megan Bonner and joining me as always is my wonderful co-host Christy Powell. Howdy. You may notice that we are actually, we usually have three people here, but tonight we only have two. And that is because we invited Dr. Hector Garcia into our studio. We sat down with him just a few days ago and we had a wonderful conversation. Um, I thought it was, I mean, I'm a nerd. And so I totally nerded out. How about you? Yeah, absolutely. It was uh, an incredible opportunity, honestly, to get to talk to somebody who is, uh, you know, just such an expert that's really taken the time and been able to do the research and just throw themselves headlong into something. And then to have the opportunity to just pick their brain and right. steal all of that research and mm -hmm. sort of pass it off as if I actually understand things just because I read the book and <laughs> uh -huh. got to have the conversation. So it was great. I mean, you are a professional yourself. So, I mean, you, yeah, you probably yeah, understand it a tiny bit more than I did, but uh, I have to say he did put it into a very digestible format. Yeah. And this, of course, is um, his books. His first is Alpha God. Uh, we have uh, one here in the studio, and we also have a picture up here on the TV. And his newest book is Sex, Power, and Partisanship. And we kind of talked a little bit about both. Yeah. It, um, and it was just super fascinating. And so for your viewing pleasure, here is at least part of our interview. I, I, I think the audience, before we get really deep into it, would probably benefit from, um, from a, a thumbnail sketch of, of your thesis in, a, in this second book. And I think, I think we want to keep, I wanna, I'm just saying, we probably want to tie back to your first book on Alpha God occasionally, because I think there's some concepts that just kind of go back and forth between the two, but so let's focus on uh, on your second book here. Tell us a bit about that. Well, so so I develop um, some ideas that have been uh, recognized by the popular media uh, uh, about how uh, partisanship tends to have a gender feel to it. So mm -hmm. you know, conservatism tends to have a masculine feel, and and. Uh, Political liberalism, liberalism tends to have a feminine feel. In fact, Chris Matthews once called the the Republican Party the Daddy Party and Democrats the the Mommy Party. Hmm. So there, I don't often say this, but there is some empirical validity to that idea, which came out of the popular media. But um, so I, I developed I developed the idea um, of well, I, I, I focus on the uh, evolutionary pressures that gave us political partisanship. Mm -hmm. And uh, mostly what I focus on is the threat of germs in the evolutionary past, mm -hmm. uh, the challenges of rearing human offspring into uh, in, uh, independence, into adulthood, which is a huge task compared to other species who spend so much time in independence, mm -hmm. and dealing with the hostility of outside tribes, which has shaped uh, our, our political psychology in so many ways. You know, but I, but before we even talk about this, I, I always have to give this caveat that we when we talk about evolutionary science, we we got to be careful not to make what's called the naturalistic fallacy. Mm -hmm. Just because something's arrived at through genetic means or through biological means does not mean that it's necessarily moral or that it's inevitable. Because sometimes, it's, most a lot of times, it's 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 neither of those things. But so. Um, and, and also to point out that a lot of our our evolutionary psychology is under the radar of consciousness, what mm -hmm. what has been termed you know instinct blindness. So mm -hmm. so you know we have all these preferences, all these likes, all these passions, all these dislikes, including in politics, but we're largely not aware of them. Um, so what I what I'm trying to do, along with so many other people who write in the evolutionary sciences, is bring these bring these impulses up for rational examination. The uh, unconscious biases. The unconscious biases. Why somebody might be inspired or repelled by the words of a of a president. Mm -hmm. Why somebody might feel so strongly about a particular policy. Um, some people have these very strong feelings. Uh, uh, like about what we politics. might call a gut reaction. A gut reaction. 
Absolutely, and and a lot of times people can't really explain why, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and they have this gut reaction without even knowing, uh, you know, what a particular policy stands for. So, can you give um, us some examples of of the instinct blindness? Because I thought that was a key part to the whole book. But you really have to understand it to to see how it plays into everything. Oh, I mean, just just on on a very broad scale. So, for example, you know, uh, it benefits us to. To uh, to love our children, right? And and we we love our children. We are tr- we want we want uh, you know an attractive mate. So we may have have, have lust for an attractive mate, but we normally don't think about about the uh, you know the fitness gains, the genetic fitness gains that we that we stand to 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 have from those emotions, right? Mm-hmm. That's that's meant to perpetuate the, our, our our genes into future generations. So. Um, Preferences for for taller leaders, for example, there was a study looking at U.S. Uh, presidential elections over 300 years, and found that uh, in the vast majority of these elections, the taller of the candidate won, and all candidates were on average taller than the average male in in the U.S. Mm-hmm. So, so um, do we consciously think, oh, I want a big president? Maybe, but probably not. But but you know, uh, it has some appeal, obviously, because it's it's reflected in who we vote for. So those kinds of things, and all this is very, very, very primitive. Mm-hmm. So it, it ties back to a time where I, I think critical for understanding both my books is the fact that most of our human evolution was uh, it was very fraught. You know, uh, when we were hunter gatherers, there was danger all around us, and. Despite what some of my fellow lefty uh, scholars would wish to argue, you know, there was a lot of, of human on human violence. So, mm-hmm. so one one researcher looked at, for example, contemporary foragers, and which are hunter gatherers who do some basic gardening, right, and found right. that up to thirty thirty percent of all the the, the men get killed by male on male violence. Mm-hmm. That is it, that is astoundingly high. And we can also deduce from looking at the archaeological records, seeing all these massacre sites where it just it's obvious a massacre took place. So that that pressure l- downstream, millions of years later, mm-hmm. has resulted in in certain political preferences. So whether and whether we acknowledge consciously the bias toward or against violence, it is still there unconsciously. So we do have this dynamic where. We don't maybe physically fight, but we do politically fight. We politically fight. We form political tribes. They're, they can be very insular. I mean, one thing is for sure, we, we evolved in these small, close-knit groups of people that identified the in-group, identified rules for the in-group, and morality did not extend much past that. Mm-hmm. You know, so Not only to mention that these groups, these tribes were not huge. They were small enough to where everyone knew everyone else. Yeah, yeah. What's what's known as Dunbar's number. So it it you know, they're topping out about 150 people. So interestingly, when you look at business, when you look at at uh, military organization, like most groups are are like 150 people because organization stops starts to to break down when you get larger than that. So so even big organizations are chunked that way. Right. So so we have this tribalistic brain. Um, and it, it gets enacted in politics. And the biggest thing I want people to know from both of these books is that if you don't know your evolved psychology, mm. others who know it better are going to use it to manipulate mm. you. Hack mm. that. Yeah. Yes. They're going to hack it. They're gonna it's do. a little uncomfortable to look at these things in this way. I mean, uh, in your book, you use the phrase, making the natural seem strange. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and. It it really does feel that way because uh, a lot of your your suppositions or some of the premises are fairly straightforward, but they also feel like they're coming at you sideways, uh, and that's to me what's so confusing and interesting about evolutionary psychology as a field. Yeah, yeah, making the natural seem strange. That was a recommendation by the great American psychologist William James, and who who said, you know, a lot of these processes are so they're so intuitive and they're so reflexive. That in order to to really see them, you have to distance yourself from things that seem natural. Like, well, of course we love our children, but why? 
Right. You know, what purpose does that serve? Of course we want a sexy partner. Okay, but what purpose does that serve? Making the natural seem strange, and you, and you have to do that. And it can be uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. It, so, But I, I think evolutionary science can be like good psychotherapy. Mm. You know, It may show you not what you want to see, but what you need to see. And what Pointing out there? those biases and exactly. yeah, understanding yourself better. Exactly. Every day we make food choices. And, I mean, that's, that's really on a daily basis. And those food choices, for example, do I, do I like sugar? I did a 23andMe recently, and it said, I like salt more than sugar, right? So that is built, baked right into my genetics that I'm going to prefer salty potato chips probably to a piece of candy. That is really, really basic stuff, what I choose to eat every day. And that's... Uh, we can expand that then and look at what other things are being influenced. What other decisions besides what I choose to eat for lunch could be being directly impacted. I mean, whether I can drink milk or not is, uh, we know that's genetic. There's a whole genetic piece of that. Yeah. But I, I'm just guessing. Yeah. I'm, I'm just trying to bring it down to the level of the, of the listener. You make decisions every day that are impacted by this instinct blindness. You don't even know you're making that choice based on your genetics. So absolutely. Uh, is that, I don't know. What no, do you think of that? That's yeah. that's that's absolutely true. I mean it boils down to our physiology, it boils down to our endocrinology, our our, our you know, our neurochemistry. Um but I, I think the part that I that I I believe requires the most scrutiny is those impulses that that cause uh, you know aggression and social breakdown and uh, oppression, things like that. So um, yeah. that's the, one example. Okay, so when you look at our fear of germs, mm. they fall on a natural curve, right? The, 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 the bell-shaped curve. So we all have differences in how, how much we, we fear germs. And, and there are these really cool questionnaires designed to, to get at this. So, uh, you know, asking people how much they'd be grossed out by eating monkey meat, for example, or mm. seeing an unflushed stool in a toilet, (laughs) you know, Mm. gross stuff like that. So you can rate that on the natural curve. Well, when you also look at political orientation, it maps on almost perfectly. So people on the conservative end of the spectrum tend to fear germs more. People on the more liberal end tend to fear germs far less. So also fear of outsiders, fear of, of new people. Um, that falls on the natural curve and it maps on almost perfectly with, with uh, political orientation. So when you think about this, in our ancestral past, um, we were very vulnerable to, to outside diseases. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, you know, how many Native Americans got wiped out by things that, that European community for? You know, millions probably. So the threat of outside diseases, even for something as simple as, as like the common cold, was very real. Who brought outside diseases? You know, who brought who? Who? How did you arrive at those at those pathogens? Well, it's usually newcomers who brought diseases that you didn't have an immunity for. Mm-hmm. So it made it made sense to the correlation, not but, necessarily causation, but the correlation was obvious to those who were getting sick. Oh, new people came in, we got sick. Must be new people. Well, obvious or not obvious, it you know might be that instinctual fear of others and outsiders that you know we don't necessarily associate with germs uh, directly or thinking right. about it in that way. But that's sort of what's at play there, or what we've been uh, yeah. selected for for millions of years. Sure, Is that about right. Sure. So, so in, in in that kind of environment, it it actually makes evolutionary sense to develop a prejudicial psychology against outsiders because mm-hmm. that could prevent you from getting getting pathogens that just wipe out your entire clan. You know, the big question is how much that serves us now that we that we know about basic hand washing, you know, and, and basic, you know, sanit- um, we have we have vaccines, we have antibiotics. Does that really serve us to have that that psychology? Um, the other thing is that that gets manipulated. Well, hello there. Howdy, yeah, cut that just a, a little bit shy, but um, yeah, it was a, a really interesting conversation, and I, it's kind of fun going back over it and seeing, you know, the the questions I didn't get answered and sort of the things that, uh, man, just fascinate me about this whole field. Yeah, and like I said before, I totally nerded out during this entire interview, mm-hmm. so I was just so... Uh, with the whole topic and the whole mm, thing. Mm-hmm. So um, I think what 
what he was going to finish Reading off with mm-hmm. is that um, these things, uh, reiterating that these things are hijacked, um, these biological imperatives yeah, that, that we have that have evolved over so much time have been hacked for alternate purposes. Yeah, that they were incredibly useful in getting us this far. Mm -hmm. uh, And it's sort of built into our DNA because people who didn't have that instinct died off, didn't reproduce. Right. Uh, And so now we're sort of stuck with all of these things that got us this far. What we could maybe call like evolutionary baggage. Yeah. And and in some ways, they're like vestigial organs. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're very useful and they're defensive. And they, again, these are our defense mechanisms, whether we're talking about biologically or socially or whatever else, uh, that allowed us to become the dominant species on the planet. So, you know, great. Awesome. Right. But... You know, it's 2019. Mm-hmm. We are evolved beyond that. And Our we society has evolved beyond that. Yeah, and we don't necessarily need to see, say, a caravan of women and children coming up towards our southern border with this fear of outsiders and this concern of disease right. uh, when in our we modern world— We have vaccines world, for that. Yeah, we have ways around that, and we have, uh, you know, a desire to see— all humans flourish rather than just our local tribe. Right. And and being the ACA, the atheist community of Austin, I would say that not every atheist would call themselves also a humanist. But mm, I would say the atheist community of Austin would also call itself humanist. A humanist, a humanist community. community. Sure. And, you know, using that to remind ourselves that we can... Um, we can overcome these evolutionary imperatives. Mm, or, sure. Uh, and get we have an opportunity these... to be better. Yeah, you exactly. Know? I mean, we, we've invented if we can culture and agriculture and medicine and, you know, all right. of these things. And if we can just consciously recognize, and we'll get into that a little bit more in the conversation later, if we can consciously recognize that these things are happening and that – these mechanisms exist, then maybe we can start realizing that we don't have to just follow our biology and we can be better humans. Yeah. And and we'll get back into the conversation. Mm -hmm. I think Hector lays this out really well, but uh, the important thing that he harps on is the fact that these these exploits, if you will, these holes in our thinking Mm -hmm. exist and us learning about them is a way of, you know, working around them and, and evolving beyond them. Uh, but whether we're doing that or not, mm-hmm. advertisers are doing it. Yes. You know, uh, super PACs are doing it. Politicians yep. are doing it. And so becoming aware of them is a really important way of, of sort of protecting ourselves and protecting our society from some of these really manipulation, outdated yeah, thought processes mm-hmm. that are being manipulated. And if any of you have any thoughts, questions, or comments, uh, please feel free to call us at 512-686-0279. And that number is also on your screen in case you forget it. Uh, Christy, did you have any comments, uh, say, like like and subscribing comments that you wanted to get into? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, it always helps us out and helps new people find the show. So we do appreciate when you do that. Uh, I also wanted to mention right as we jump into the next clip that Mm -hmm. uh, the voice you're hearing, we apologize for not mentioning, that is uh, Dr. Daryl Ray, our uh, producer emeritus and And, uh, founder founder of the show. Yeah. uh, So he uh, he jumped on the phone and uh, joined us in that conversation. We did have some technical issues. Otherwise, he he totally would have joined us in video, uh-huh. but I actually saw uh, Mark, our producer, and Daryl working out some some of those bugs just yesterday. Okay, so we're going to have so his wonderful face joining us here soon. Yes, one okay, can great. only hope. Um, but with that, I think uh, I would just like to say again, like, subscribe, please. Um, that's how we get out and about. Uh, As they say, and also, if you have any questions, 512-686-0279. And with that, Ben, our current producer, would you like to roll the next thing? We evolved all all of these unconscious biases as a part of a survival mechanism for evolution or through evolution. Do you think that the society we've created uh, evolved faster than we were able to evolve 
out of these biases? That's a terrific question. Yes, I do. I do. I mean, the the world we have created around us is an eye blink of time on an evolutionary scale. Mm-hmm. We we've only been occupying this world for a, a, a second. Mm-hmm. You know, so comparatively, comparatively, yeah. so so we're moving into a more globally interconnected world that's connected through economies, through culture, um, through through infrastructure. Um, through space, you know, and and so, so uh, you know, societies larger than we were ever evolved to handle, and and more diverse, and, and more integrated. So so we have to pay attention to those impulses that that cause the you know societal uh, unrest and breakdown, and and you know get people to fighting in the streets over policy, like we've seen since the 2016 election. Mm-hmm. You know, there's been a lot of division. So. So that's you know overall that's the main goal I think of of both of my books to understand where this comes from because if we understand it we're going to be you know are we going to be more or less likely to enact these impulses one of the things that occurred to me as I was reading the book is and I think you addressed it but I uh, correct me you know if I'm wrong but you know the whole notion of germs is a fairly modern idea it's only been around for less than 200 years right and yet and yet this issue is really not germs, although we use the word germs, it's really around just disease. And if you look back thousands of years, that you always other what other group with the notion that they are diseased. I mean, whether it was sure. Jews or, or gypsies or sure. or um Haitians or, you know, any name that any number of people that we have always othered with the notion of disease. Uh, I think that's a powerful idea once you understand how that works in us, then we can be manipulated all over all over the place by those who would uh, use that fear for us. And it's a very mm-hmm. natural, normal thing to be afraid of disease because it's going to kill our kids, and yeah. we want to protect our kids and so forth. Yeah. yeah. Well, I also think it's really interesting that... Um, you know, as natural uh, and it's sort of intuitive, I guess, as this othering of uh, of foreigners and different things feels, uh, the fact that we do have such like much more strict laws with regards to protecting people in those situations. So, you know, our, our hate crime laws are a lot more strict than if you were to commit a crime against somebody, you know, in the in group. And I'm wondering if that is a a reaction to this you know very strong drive or or where that's coming from why we see that as so condemnable i think sensible policy sensible legislation takes into account these evolutionary impulses mm-hmm. so so you know on the topic of 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 sexuality so one of the things i write about in 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 both my books is how how much of our politics and how much of our religions are grounded in male mate competition mm-hmm. males compete for for mates and and you know writ large i think you know conservatism political conservatism is based on favoring male reproductive interests um so that's why in the most conservative societies you see mate guarding Mm. so powerfully in- embedded in those societies. So there's mm-hmm. been these, these... To the detriment of the females. To the absolute detriment of the females. So it's, it's it, you know, one, one sex's strategy has absolute dominion over the other. So when we look at the most politically conservative societies across the world, overwhelmingly, they tend to be Muslim majority. Mm-hmm. Overwhelmingly, they tend to be, you know, patriarchal, and they tend to restrict women's women's movement all all towards preventing cuckoldry you know this this idea that you know you you know to prevent the risk of of you raising another man's offspring mm-hmm. which is an evolutionary evolutionarily dangerous so women in these societies you know uh all, all of the 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 oppressive laws and dictates are 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 based on that not letting women leave the house without a male chaperone you know, not not let drive expose their faces. I mean, these kinds of things. Drive well, expose their faces. N- not only that, but there's also the um, the societal pressure for the women themselves to be chaste, to be, you know, beholding only to one partner, right. which is an extreme pressure that we still. I mean, slut shaming and all of these societal pressures on the idea of the female only having one mate or one mate at a time to ensure you know 
theoretically where the offspring is coming from. Yeah, and 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 it, it's just you know some of these laws are just uh, you know from 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 the, the the perspective of humanism are just absolutely absurd. Like you know or practices, I should say. So women getting uh, murdered for getting raped or getting beaten for getting raped. Mm -hmm. Something completely against their control, and yet they suffer consequences outside of that. in a way failed to maintain their Their, their chastity and their protection of the male resources, you know, towards raising children. Yes. One one thing that that kind of uh, was very enlightening in, in, in doing the research for this book and and whenever you write a book, you're teaching yourself, you know. So I'm like sure. learning things and going, wow, yeah, oh my sure. gosh, yeah. right, Daryl? <laughs> Was that, you know, in non-human animals, when there, when there is a, a, a different, like the sex ratio is off, we have more of one sex, mm-hmm. mate guarding increases to deal with the surplus of rivals. Mm-hmm. So the most skewed sex ratios are also in Islamic nations. So you have the highest mate guarding and the highest skewed sex ratios where you have more men in those societies. Competing for the female resource. Competing for the female resources. So we see this in other species. We have to understand, you know, um, what pushes these things. And, and, you know, a lot of this is is as a result of sex selective, you know, aborticide and and femicide and things like that, that that cause that. But this is straight up evolutionary biology working its way into policy that I think is impressive. So... In- yeah, if you if you look at the places in just the United States that are most conservative, mate guarding tradition. I mean, the whole Southern tradition of of male dueling and stuff like that that happened earlier in the, the nation's history. That that ties into all that. The male's honor is tied up with his female and, and ownership of that female and that sort of stuff. Absolutely. And, and I think bringing it back to the idea of disease, um, in politics nowadays, I hear quite often the word plague being used. This, this, um, you know, what is it? Uh, teenage pregnancy. It's a plague across the nation. Oh, mm-hmm. You know, yeah. uh, STDs. This is a plague across the, these, uh, um, using that innate fear to press an agenda by describing an entire action or a group of people as a plague. Absolutely. And, and look, you know, the, these, these big media outlets, political handlers who, who, who work on, you know, for example, Trump's campaign or anybody's campaign, they know this research. They know this research. So that's not on accident. That's a good observation. I don't think that's on, on accident because they know that their, their viewership their electorate is going to respond to those things. So, and, and Daryl, you're right. I mean, during during the Holocaust, Jews were 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 framed as vermin. Well, vermin carry disease. Mm-hmm. You know, Trump right. Trump has talked about how immigrants are going to come in and infest our country. Mm-hmm. So, none of this is accidental. No, and in the in the middle, uh, not the Middle Ages, but in the Thirty Years' War, the the um, the references to disease. Yeah. Of the Protestants or the Catholics, yeah. depending mm-hmm. on which side you're on. The other side was disease or was bringing disease or was poisoning the wells with disease. You know, there's all sorts of disease references in you know, the Thirty Years' War. And it's one of the most devastating wars in human history, just in terms of percentage of population that were killed. And a lot of them were killed by disease. <laughs> <laughs> and Christian on Christian. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Christian on Christian, right? Yeah, Protestants. They like <laughs> part of the saying, reason the disease was so prevalent is you have armies running around with no sanitation. Well, they they bring tons of disease with them when when those armies run around. So you could easily associate armies with disease and infestation. I mean, all these things start coming together. And I have one thought uh, after I finished the book. I, I I just sat around for a week or so. I didn't even tell you I was finished with it, uh, Hector. Uh, not because I didn't want to. I was just thinking about it. You really triggered a bunch of ideas and thoughts. But I, I have one, and this may be an unfair question. Save it for later or don't answer it if you don't want to yet. But once you finish that book and you sat back and you thought about it for a few months yourself, did any new ideas come to you that thought, dang, uh, well, not that you would have included them in the book, but important ideas that you would like to tell us today. I, I didn't know if anything came to mind. Well, you know, framing, framing things in a certain way. So, so 
you know, just how how male coalitionary violence has shaped both conservatism and liberalism. So, so to make the natural seem strange, let, let's think about this for a second. So male competition among chimpanzees, sometimes it's easier to look at other species, right? That's how we make the natural seem strange. So and we don't mm-hmm. have all that baggage that we're bringing to it as we're watching them fight and everything. We're not... You know, seeing our own blue versus it's an red and all of for that. Our yeah. Own. Oh, sure. That's just basic. I mean, I mean, as you'll learn as a therapist, I mean, it's way easier to see somebody else's stuff oh, than, sure. than one's own. own. Mm-hmm. So, so within the, there's there's within competition in a chimpanzee troop, right? And usually, you know, males compete for dominance, and that confers se- you know sexual dominance. That, that confers um, you know. Just more copulations than opportunity. Than, than, uh, opportunity. There's competition for food, right? So, so that can that can be violent, uh, but it's driven by male mate competition because the the more dominant the male, the the more that male reproduces his genes into future generations. You so in many ways, liberalism is it developed as a psychology to help cope with that. With that kind of with that kind of arrangement, and to help prevent those males at the apex of of the primate dominance hierarchy from from getting too much control and impinging on your own reproductive uh, imperatives, right? Mm-hmm. So that's why that's why so many people who are lower on the rung tend to support liberal policies like ethnic minorities, like women, and that's why it's it's so much about checks and balances, checks and balances on those in power. You know, liberals are way more for that. Liberals are way more for redistribution of power and greater and opportunities and, 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 and redistribution of wealth. But there's also competition between groups. <laughs> and you see this, if you... Uh, I, if you ever get a chance to, to see this on, on YouTube, just, just Google, you know, chimpanzee raids or chimpanzee warfare. Mm-hmm. All male groups forming these coalitions when they, they walk silently through the jungle conduct these vicious attacks on the rival chimpanzee troop. If they find like a, a lone male or a smaller party, just tear them to pieces. Well, they keep doing that and keep doing that, and eventually they wipe out the entire chimpanzee troop, absorb all its females, take over its territory. Mm-hmm. That is mate competition on a group level. Mm-hmm. So, so a lot of political conservatism was based on this behavior among humans because humans did this forever and ever. It's imperial expansion. It's imperial expansion, and it has reproductive rewards. So you, we can see when we when we apply our evolutionary forensics to political partisanship, you see this male coalitionary violence. You see its fingerprints all over political conservatism. So take, for example, this this measure used to uh, this questionnaire used to measure uh, political conservatism called right wing authoritarianism. Mm-hmm. So this was developed in the aftermath of World War II when, when we were trying to make sense of, you know, what in the hell gave the world Adolf Hitler? Mm-hmm. How could this have happened? How could people be so subservient to power authorities and things? Precisely. Why in didn't fact, someone stand up? Why didn't somebody stand up? How could, how could, we, how could we have fallen into this? Mm-hmm. So, in fact, you know, one of the three factors is submitting to authority figures, mm-hmm. right? Submitting control to authority figures, to those who are in power. It's usually men. Mm-hmm. It's usually powerful men. It's usually big men, right? Um, conforming to social norms, conforming to group norms, con- conformity, group rules, group think, and aggressing against outsiders. That's the th- that's the third the third uh, you know major factor. So when we look at that, that maps on almost perfectly with the organization of the military. That is military social organization. You defer you defer to those in positions of power. You have to have that. How, if 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 uh, decision making were all was democratic, and and soldiers weren't especially obliged to obey commands. How quickly would that group get slaughtered against the outside tribe? Mm-hmm. And how many things would actually get done? And how many things would actually get done, right? Um, conformity, you see that so much in the military. Conformity to dress, to haircuts, to lingo, to rules. Rules are very strictly applied. And hierarchy. And hierarchy, because who sets the rules? The person at the top. So, um, you know, and also aggressing against outsiders is the very purpose of, uh, the very purpose of military. So, so, you know, Right-wing authoritarianism has a militaristic purpose to it. 
Mm-hmm. And who who comprises the military? Well, it's male coalitions who, for the, you know, our entire history as a species, we've engaged in these kind of raids against one another to gain territory, to gain women, uh, to gain you know all the all the, the resources within within territory. So. so um, that it has a martial purpose, and it's very old, and it's very primitive. And so, people on the more conservative end, they're going to give up control to those in authority. So, to your point, well, and in some ways, oh, sorry, go in ahead. Some ways, the winners are the people who are sitting here today mm. in this on the planet today. The winners are are are, are what? Well, the winners of that contest over the last two thousand, three thousand, five thousand years are the ones that are alive today had the opportunity to reproduce and continue to do so yeah. sure i mean that's that's in that's in our our all of our genome to to uh, you know one extent or another but yeah. um you know so so what i i i like to geek out on a little bit mm-hmm. you know throughout all, all the talks that i give in these two books is like how the appeal to to largeness the appeal to you know if if you're looking up to authority figure Having a big leader is emotionally intuitive to us. Physically mm-hmm. overbearing. Physically overbearing, right? I mean, I mean, you know, Donald Trump went on and on and on about, <clears throat> you know, disparaging his rivals as little Marco, little George Stephanopoulos. Mm. They're little. I'm big. You know, who cares? Is he ever going to really represent us in a physical fight? No. Is it intuitive to our evolved psychology? It sure appears yeah, that way. These yeah. insults about him having little There's, hands little ha- and how that got under his say, skin and yeah. everything, that, that all speaks to his, you know, the fitness to actually, you know, fight for us in a very literal sense, even if that's not anything that we would need from him, from our commander-in-chief. Right. I don't know if it is evolution on the part of the female of for us to look for the stronger, the dominant, the the one that we can— hope will be able to protect our offspring. Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, you know, Ann Coulter said, you know, was just all over Trump at first. You know, she's like, basically what what did it for me was his promise to protect us from the Mexican rapists, Mm -hmm. you know, to protect us. I would walk on glass for him, she said. She's changed her mind. You know, she's called him an idiot since then. But but yeah, that's a strong It took a little while. It took a little while. But not only that... (laughs) You know, not only that, but when w- there's there's an appeal to those kind of men because if you're living in, in an environment that's full of danger, and that that you know there are these power struggles that are won by violence and size, you're going to want male offspring that can compete in those environments, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So there's an appeal to those men for what they what they can provide for you in terms of your male offspring that you make with that person. It's called the sexy son hypothesis. Mm-hmm. So in, in that kind of environment, do you really want to mate with timid, small, you know? Uh, even if they're going to share their power with you, even if they're going to in some ways, you know, uh, offer the, the woman more opportunity or more resources, uh, or maybe not more resources, but just more privilege, um, you know, as we kind of look at that dichotomy between liberalism and conservatism, uh, there's, you know, yeah. more sharing of power, but not as much protection. Well, brain so, versus brawn. Bra- yeah, it, it can be brain versus brawn. So it's it's all complicated, and it and it works off it works off all these pressures that we've been experiencing. So in more fraught environments, women tend to prefer more masculine males with you know higher testosterone. Another thing about higher testosterone is mm-hmm. is that testosterone is an immunosuppressant. Mm-hmm. So if so in, in place you have a lot of disease, if you're able to have big muscles and, and be and be manly, you got a good immune system. Mm-hmm. So in places where there's more disease, women tend to prefer that more. And that, isn't that blow your mind? So all this is happening underneath the radar of our consciousness. In fact, the more we move away from the equator, where there's, you know, l- more contagious disease in hotter mm-hmm. climates, the <laughs> more liberal people become because germs are influencing influencing us. Germs are influencing us. Yeah, I mean, in a lot of ways, it has, you know, shaped our society, shaped our, our species, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, any disease or germ that we have come up against, and I use the royal we, of course. Right. (laughs) um, The human race has come up against 
has either had it been done for or has managed to somehow beat it back. Right. Yeah. I I think of War of the Worlds and, you know, just the things that it took for our species to survive. And, uh, you know, some of the baggage, like you said, that we carry with us because of that. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, as a therapist, there's something I've said on this show many times that I just couldn't shake while we were watching this episode about how, uh, you know, when it comes to our thoughts, our emotions, you know, those those just happen. You know, those aren't ever anything I ask people to apologize for. It's Mm -hmm. our actions, our words, our deeds that we need to be held accountable for. So for me, one of the beautiful things about this thought process, the kind of these thought experiments of understanding ourselves and our species from an evolutionary standpoint Mm -hmm. is getting a little bit of an explanation on where some of those thoughts are coming from. You yeah, know? so you don't you can explain a little bit and not have such an oh I'm, my god I'm such a horrible person feeling. Yeah. It's no, this is where this is coming from, but that doesn't mean I can't rise above that. Exactly. You're not a monster for being maybe a little afraid of strangers, for being mm-hmm. afraid of people from other countries. I mean, these are very natural impulses. But like Hector said, we don't want to make the naturalistic fallacy and assume that just because something is natural, natural, it's it's, right. It's right or good or inevitable. Mm -hmm. You know, those feelings might come from somewhere deep in our genetic code. But as evolved beings, we have the opportunity now to understand those feelings and uh, and control them and drive them towards, you know, a better world. And, you know, we have evolved um, a society past our human evolution, our societal mm-hmm. evolution, and our uh, the evolution of our... The technology uh, of our culture. Right. The technology and the scientific knowledge that we have now mm-hmm. has brought us to a point where maybe those things don't need to be as scary. Now, you can feel that gut reaction, but then take a moment and think, is that gut reaction because there's an actual... Um, danger to myself or, you know, those I care about? Or is this just some gut reaction vestigial yeah. left over from, you know, the evolutionary process where it was a real danger? Yeah, those emotions are very human. Mm-hmm. What you choose to do with them is who you are as a person right? and who we aspire to. Yeah. And I think uh, with that, we still do not have any callers. So please, uh, 512-686-0279 if you'd like to call in. And don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button. And with that, Ben, would you like to roll the next one? The idea of the social liberalism, do you find that be also maybe a human attempt to socially evolve Rather than, you know, fa- to socially evolve faster than we have been able to uh, physically and uh, chemically evolve to kind of compensate, like Christy was saying, compensate for the overwhelming amount of ma- what we would call today uh, just uh, what am I thinking of masculine uh, dominance, machismo, mm-hmm. yeah. testosterone, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, those thumpers. those things that we find in a civil society can cause issues. Well, that's a that's a great question, and you know, I, I I always like to point out that you know, I I war studies is my focus, you know, and I I, I think it's I think it's important to understand that we have these old impulses that are based on competition to do terrible things to one another because understanding those is, is a route to, you know, to, to producing more peaceable, more humane, uh, uh, more, more constructive, more stable societies. But we also have the capacity for great empathy, mm-hmm. you know, and that's part of our, that's part of our genetic uh, legacy as well, you know. Um, in that small group. In, in that small group, and and sometimes between groups, so I think that is the liberal endeavor. So, so um, you know, there's there's research showing suggesting that you know part of liberalism may have developed as a way to help us immigrate, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Because liberals tend to be far more interested in people and outside people. Yep. So, curious would be probably uh, one good way to put it. Curiosity is 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 in many ways, you know, especially concerning other people, it, it is one of those those factors. 
and we call that uh, uh, xenophilia. So interested in other people, interested in other cultures, interested in traveling, you know, which may have served us as well, which extends the, the cooperative exchange across groups. And that, facili- that facilitated us to, to migrate and populate the world and, and to interact with the people we encountered. So if we simplify and, and perhaps oversimplify, uh, but we see this sort of conservatism, uh, distrust of outsiders, uh, deference to leaders, things like that, as a you know way of protecting the tribe during you know especially war times or times of significant distress, and then liberalism as a way of sort of distributing power, keeping uh, the people on top in check, and those two sort of checks and balances. You talk in Alpha God an awful lot about how uh, the male God is sort of like the ultimate representation Mm -hmm. of masculinity and maybe of that sort of conservative value. That being said, as, you know, uh, over the, over the entire globe, as, um, you know, life expectancies go up, food shortages go down, you know, these sorts of things. Can we correlate or see a, uh, a decrease in religion? As things continue in that direction, oh boy! Well, I I I hope so. You know, I think a lot of things may may uh, may contribute to that. Just access to information, mm-hmm. but I think I get your point. You 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 know, the point is that was you know having that kind of God was something we're drawn to in times of distress, right? Do you know when when we become. Uh, you know, safer or more certain in, in our our ability to survive, our ability to gain just the basic resource we need to survive. You know, will we glom onto that less? A lot of people suggest that. You know, when there's less uncertainty, you glom onto religion less. When there's good social services, when there's good social, um, you know, like like in Scandinavia, where where you know, if if you're struggling, the state's going to get your back. You know, there's there's less religion in these countries because there's the community government. support outside community. of the religious structure. Yeah, fear fear drives us towards religion for sure. Existential uncertainty drives us towards religion, no question. But it does so on these really primitive violence, pathways. Male coalitional violence doesn't get you anywhere in Sweden, whereas it might get you somewhere in you know in some other patriarchal conservative society. So being like brash and pushing people around and bullying people in the boardroom, you're suggesting might be yeah. more successful in Iran than in Scandinavia. Is that kind of yeah. what you what you mean, Daryl? Right. Yeah. Yeah, and partly because there's better social services for women, though you don't have to you don't have to rely on men to access to resources because you have paid maternity leave, you have a, a really solid welfare system, you have you have you know state run childcare services. I want to take a moment because this is secular sexuality and I want to kind of dive a little deeper into the idea of how all of this has created this culture we have now where we're slowly working our way toward a bit more equality but we are by and far away from equality across the board and what how to say what uh, evidence did you come across that would lend itself for an explanation um, more, I should say, more than we've already discussed of in this day and age, this modern day and age, we still have, like you were saying, tapping into these unconscious biases. Maybe what can we do to help alleviate some of that? Critical thinking skills, they need to be taught. They need to be a mandatory part of public education. That's something that's not talk, talked about. You know, teaching us about, about our, you know, our cognitive biases, motivated reasoning, and like all, all the slew of biases that are studied by cognitive psychologists, teaching that at a young age. That can be done. Um, teaching people this science, protecting this science, which shows that, you know, that we have these um, very emotionally powerful impulses that can get manipulated by those in power. Um, you know, for example, there was there was one uh, uh, senator, I forget who it was, um, but he said that, you know, one of the causes of the Columbine shooting was was moms who take birth control pills. You know, just try, you know, you, you exactly, yeah, exactly, <laughs> you know. Um, I didn't hear that one. Yeah, trying to, you know, trying to, to, to scare women out of sexual independence, you, you know, 
uh, by saying, you know, your children are going to get killed. If you yeah. take birth control. If you take birth it's, it's something right out of, you know, something you'd, you'd hear in Iran, you know. And completely unfounded, too. Can you guess what party that statement came from? Um, <laughs> let, me, let me take a moment. It's, this one's a, a, a brain bender. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, knowing, knowing what you've written in, in both books, actually, you could almost put together a, a playbook for manipulating human polity, human political systems. Uh, I know that playbook exists. It may not exist in uh, using the terminology that you use, Hector, but it, you keep suggesting that the people who are running elections know this stuff. They know this and stuff. Where, where else are you seeing I'm, – I'm just curious. Where else are you seeing evidence that those, unbi- those biases are being – Exploited, Deeply programmed, or influenced. Oh, yeah. in the marketplace. Right. In the marketplace. So, yeah. So, Alex Jones. Uh, he, yeah, what's amazing is he's from here, right? Or, yeah, yeah he's we in don't. Austin. We don't talk about that. We we don't. We yeah. We our people do not know his people. <laughs> yeah. Well. So so he he has this this guy come on his show, uh, Doctor Edward Group the Third, and it's what it's, a name. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, last week tonight. I, the, you got You got to watch this episode. Mm-hmm. So he says he's a he's an MIT alum. He's a doctor. MIT later on, you know, refuted like yeah, he's not an MIT alum. Oh, he, yeah, it's like he came to talk to us once or something. He came to talk to us once, and and so you know, for example, Alex Jones makes a fortune selling these worthless products, mm-hmm. and and you know he was he was selling supplements on one of his show, and so he has this guy Edward Group come on and says. Yeah, I mean, you need to take these supplements because the CDC is going crazy right now with all these immigrants coming in and bringing disease. So, you know, that's a manipulation right there. But Mm -hmm. the interesting thing is, you know, he's using it to manipulate his own tribe. You know, he's using it to to, to manipulate his own tribe to buy his more power. I mean, get resources, you know, take their money and raise his own profile. And, And there's research out there showing that people on the conservative end of mm-hmm. the political spectrum, this is objective research, are more credulous. They can be manipulated more, especially when fear is involved. So there's there's a whole section of our populace who's just getting manipulated. It makes me mad for them. Well, and that makes me think that um, I think often about how it seems like the older generations are um, – more rigid and more conservative and less um, compassionate toward the other. And it makes me think through our history. I mean, think what generation that they're coming out of. Their parents went through, well, like the older generations, their parents and as they were children went through a series of military conflicts that they were directly affected by. Whereas even though we're dealing with, I mean, I remember I was a teenager on 9-11, mm. but it, it, we were a degree removed from it, uh, unless you were right there at ground zero or, you know, involved, had a family member directly involved in it, you were still kind of a degree removed from it. The likelihood that your dad went to Iraq or right, your or, brother. Or, or that you yourself were mm-hmm. directly affected but the older generations were had it in their face a lot more. And so do you think that that could have possibly an effect on hijacking that fear response and that, that protection? Well, it's interesting because um, after 9-11, you know, we saw a conservative shift even among liberals, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know. This and- is true. And there was a and there was a, a study looking at you know if you're if you were in right in the area where the attacks happened and you witnessed injury or death, mm-hmm. you, you saw a shift in right wing authoritarianism, mm-hmm. which shows like this is an ancient survival response. You know, that, it, we have been attacked. We must protect ourselves. We must fight back. Yeah, against the male coalitions because you know all of them were male. Just keep that in mind. You know, watching that, it made me think um, about how, generally speaking, when you are in a conversation with someone and mm-hmm. maybe you have differing ideas about something, the whole idea of um, feeling attacked 
And what do you sure. do when you feel it, when you feel that your identity or you feel one of your ideas or your opinions is being attacked? Those you basic shut down. saber tooth tiger defending oh, yeah. fight or flight instincts are still coming to the table, even if it's a debate rather than a fight to the death. Right. Or even if it's just a casual conversation where someone disagrees with your opinion on a matter mm-hmm. that immediate kind of, you know, lockdown, per, you know, bat the has. Uh, what is it, bat in the hatches kind mm-hmm. of um, reaction. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that comment and and the last question that you had, uh, just kind of getting at this idea of alienation mm-hmm. and uh, how we are further and further and further away as a society from our, you know, genetic heritage. Mm-hmm. And that's why I think this is so valuable to understand. You know, as we keep pointing out, as Hector mentioned, uh, these are all part of us and we're getting further and further away from the way that they initially made sense, right? What they were evolved to do. Right. The mechanisms, what they were combating or what they were evolved to... Um, Selected to defend against. To defend against, yes. Yeah. And so now we just have them inside of us. And so, you know, getting some level of understanding and, and mastery of those things is incredibly important. Mm-hmm. And, you know, with that, we actually do have one caller on the line. And of course... If you would like to call, we have about 30 minutes left in the show. So please, uh, 512-686-0279. Or if you'd like, you can go to the uh, the Atheist Community of Austin or the Atheist Experience website and click the Call the Show button. So with that being said, uh, would you like to speak to Joey? Sure. Great. Hi, Joey. You are on the air. Oh, Hi, so um, I, I did have some questions about my sexuality. Yeah, I, was, I think I might be, I think I might be pansexual. Okay, and I'm not sure how I can tell. Mm-hmm. And and um, the thing is, my issue is, I I confronted my father about it, and he said that he was going to beat me if I was, and I don't know what to do. Okay. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know what the circumstances or what that relationship looks like, or you know how how connected you are to him or how concerned you are about those threats. I I definitely want to just let you know that that's a devastating place to be in and nothing we would ever hope for for you. You know, that being said, as far as what label best describes you, you know, I don't know that there is any genetic test or any magic way of knowing for sure. But at the same time, I, I don't know, always know that it matters. You know, certainly we've said on this show before that our identity, our labels, these things that we ascribe to and these things that we describe ourselves with are incredibly valuable. And a lot of people put a lot of blood, sweat and tears into defending those labels, into receiving those labels and uh, describing themselves that way. That being said, there's no obligation to have it figured out. You know, you don't have to go to the pan store for pansexual people to find a pan partner. You get to be in love with, to have a crush on, to have sex with the people that you want to be interested in, the people that reciprocate that feeling towards you. So whether that is a man or a woman, whether that's somebody who's non-binary or gender fluid, you know, those labels are valuable, but only when they're useful. If it's getting in the way, if it's causing you strife, I, I wouldn't let that become your focus. Yeah, I understand that. Thank you. Um, I also did have another question. Mm -hmm. Um, So I have a friend from Thailand, actually, and he said that there's this thing that they like the they call lady boys, Mm -hmm. I believe it's called. And I I don't know, like, what would that be classified as as, like sexuality? I believe it's called like she male or whatever it is. I I don't know the exact term for it. What, What kind of sexuality would that be? Yeah, so what we're kind of trying to do there is take these like very Western scholastic ideas. Sometimes they they those, so those terms can be not necessarily, but often are used that way. Right. Uh, but the kind of at the heart of the question is how do we take this uh, this very specific concept that has been 
invented by this particular culture and sort of put it under our our lens, right? Which Western scholastic academic words can we best use to describe this sort of extra or third gender? Using the labels that we tend to use here on the show. Right, exactly. Um, And so that that being said, it's really not, you know, I'm not a cultural anthropologist. It's really not my place to label or describe anybody. Uh, The the Thai ladyboy concept, I think, would generally fall under some Thing that resembles our understanding of uh, trans women. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I think that from what I understand of that culture, those people do exist as a third and distinct gender. And uh, so really, in any of this, whether we should label it this or that or the other, we want to be kind and respectful and informed about these names and about these labels. But we also just kind of want to ask the people involved. And I would say in Possibly in the same way that, you know, other languages have words for things that for concepts that Uh, we uh do not have words for. Maybe these people encapsulate a certain um, part of the spectrum that in English we don't have a word for yet. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know if that that kind of helps um, settle things at all for you, Joey. Yeah, it does. And um, I... I, I always thought, just despite being thinking I might be pansexual, that there's only two genders, male and female. So that's why I, I'm just so confused about all this. Yeah, I'm sexually confused, and honestly, I think I think that listening to this show it makes me believe that you guys are a bunch of Nickelback fans. All, All right. right. Well, um, we do have a few more lines open. We do. And uh, we'd love to hear from everybody else. In the meantime, I think we're going to go ahead and jump into the next clip. Yeah, it was a good conversation. A couple of months ago, I wrote a review on another book on evolutionary psychology. And because the Internet is the Internet, uh, I immediately ended up taking it down because I got a, a lot of attacks, yeah. not even about the review, not even about the book, which I you know, kind of panned. Uh, but about how evolutionary psychology as an entire field is sexist and uh, is just reinforcing these old narratives and giving uh, men excuses to take power by you know calling it their evolutionary birthright. And you started off by suggesting that just because something uh, happens naturally doesn't make it right or moral. Yeah. Uh, but I, I'm curious, um, not to necessarily have you defend your entire field of study, but if you could address this idea that uh, all evolutionary psychology is inherently sexist. Yeah, that's a great question. And it's actually something that I address in, in sex power and partisanship. So so making making this, uh, this naturalistic fallacy, you know, it's interesting because... Uh, that can look differently depending on where you where you are politically. Mm-hmm. So people on the left are more likely to make the fallacy. It's more likely to sound like this. Well, gender equality is desired. Therefore, any science showing gender differences, you know, can't be true because that could lead Should to gender tossed. inequality. Yeah. Sure. On the right, it's more like well, um, because there's gender. Because there are gender differences, that justifies gender inequality, right? So, you know, I think, I think you know, both of those are errors. And I think, you know, I think it's important to have the, the dispassion of, of, of a researcher when, you know, and in so far as, as, as one can, when, when looking at these things, saying this is just who we are. If we don't acknowledge it, we're going to be more inclined to commit these 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 you know, these heinous things to one another or these these bad behaviors based on these old impulses. So even if it shows us something that makes us feel uncomfortable about who we are, but we can overcome that. We can overcome our, our genes. I mean, you're wearing eyeglasses, for example, you know. Um, and I should be. <laughs> and you should be. And, and, and every, every bit of technology that we've ever created is an example of overcoming you know that the a natural is some uh, evolutionary deficit. I mean, even a stick Question. poked into a ant mound is oh, I thought just you were gonna overcoming. Say electric yeah, well, that too. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, now, you that's know, a Darwin Award, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, but yeah, when when uh, Jane Goodall is watching chimps use these mm. tools, it's to overcome you know the shortness of their own fingers or right. their dangers of getting bit or whatever else. Right. Right. So so yeah, I think I think. Um, I think this field, uh, 
you know, causes a lot of anxiety in people. But I think, I think understanding what it is and what it isn't is important. I think backing up any supposition with a lot of empirical research is important. And going into it without any preconceived notions of what you're going to find because then all you're doing is p-hacking. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, people will corrupt and use any any kind of field for their own ends. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, what I write about in Alpha God is how Buddhism was was used for, for war with kind of the same the same pattern as we saw, you know, in Christianity during the Crusades or, or, or uh, you know, in Islam with jihad. You know, so the same with with science. People can corrupt that and say, no, you know, this this, you know, that's how the eugenics movement got started. But that has to do with with our evolved psychology. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, gotta understand it. What everything I, I was just gonna say, uh, really, at the end of the day, everything goes back to evolution and how we have evolved, and recognizing that we did, we have evolved. We have some maybe more evolving to do. Mm-hmm. Um, but we need to recognize that so that we can steer, uh, overcome being manipulated. Absolutely, that's that's one that's one big reason to understand the science. And as you know, we're in a fight in this state. Mm-hmm. You know, to have this science taught in schools, and that's that's pretty serious. If we're dispensing with with one of the best mirrors that we have into mm-hmm. ourselves, if if we. If we if we start to teach creationism in schools or start to inject false uncertainty into the principles of natural selection, you know. Well, and as you've kind of suggested, it's uh, especially dangerous not um, just because this information exists. You know, uh, if we didn't understand any of these things, it would be one thing. Uh, but if we're if we do understand them as a society and we aren't teaching them to individuals then we know that the people at the top, the people that are in the boardrooms, people that are in the marketing meetings or behind the super PACs or whatever else, they are in possession of that knowledge and that disparity puts the rest of us at a huge disadvantage. It makes us much more vulnerable to manipulation. No question. Yeah. Daryl? There's one area, yeah, one area of um, research I thought was fascinating and I think I've read more stuff since I read your book that why why are why do some women buy into the cultural narrative mm. that enhances the patriarchy? I mean, why is Ann Coulter so damn gung ho about you know about that? Or or why are there so many Fox News women women that watch Fox News? And this research, I and I think you cite it, uh, Hector. The more attractive a woman is, the more likely she is to be Republican or lean towards the conservatives because she is allowed to buy in to the privilege of that um, of the of the status of yeah. That. Shit, now I need to go Patriarchy. home and look at myself in the mirror. A yeah, I was bit. about to say I, I for <laughs> one have dated a number of very lovely liberal women, but your point is well taken. Yeah, I mean Hollywood is filled with beautiful actresses and mo- who are liberal, you know, for example. So whenever we talk about about these stats, we have to think, you know, more probabilistically, but but yeah, yeah so right. so so women compete with other women and and sometimes it it favors women to to join the male hierarchy and to favor, you know, for because example, because they're going to win. Because they're going to win and to favor their their husbands their husbands uh, their husbands game over over the, over women. So when mm-hmm. women get married, they tend to turn more conservative, give and they, up careers and support and back the male in the relationship. Right, because they get part of that patriarchal dividend. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's 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 really fascinating and it's it's a hard pill for a lot of people to swallow looking at this stuff, but. But there's research looking at that that they call the Michelle Bachman effect because, you know, she's very feminine looking. And, you know, so, so, so femininity, which can be measured, and attractiveness, which can be rated, predicts uh, congresswomen's voting record, how conservative their voting record is. Mm. And this is all based on competition. So, so, you know, women compete as well for, for resources with one another. Mm-hmm. And, and, and we've got to look at that as well. And that's blind instinct, instinct blindness, because, yeah, they don't even realize they're doing it. It's just there, just part of the equation that goes into their mind when they're making decisions. 
It is, and intuitively we know yeah. this because some of these studies showed pictures of, of world leaders mm. and the, the subjects were, were naive to them. And they could, just, just based on their looks, like how attractive men and women were, they could guess that they were, that they were more conservative or more liberal. Kind of one thing we haven't talked at all about, and I thought maybe we'd get back to where we started here. Um, Megan was really curious, and I think Christy as well, as what would be the evolutionary value of Bukaki? Uh, can you help us out there? We were pondering this question before we started airing, and I'm just going to let you handle that. Oh, boy. Uh, <laughs> you, you have stumped me. Maybe it's a side effect. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think the real question is, and, and this is kind of way off base from what you're writing in the book, is why why do people enjoy such crazy, wild, uh, different kinds of sex and sexuality, mm-hmm. peacocky being only one of them? You know, it's it's part of being human. I mean, we're we're a very sexual species. You know, we do it a lot. Not only for reproduction, we do it for fun. We do it for for um, you know bonding purposes, entertainment, entertainment, entertainment. Right? Yeah. yeah. Also very curious, and we're very playful too. I think, and that all yeah. that comes into play there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so well, I we we had to at least end on a note of uh, true. Questioning about our sexuality. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and had to get Bukaki in there somehow. It's somehow. the internet, so eventually, it's yeah, gonna come all up. roads lead to whether you're talking about evolutionary psychology or politics. All roads, all, all lead, roads to lead to Bukaki. Bukaki, I guess. All right. Are you familiar with our normal outro? No. Oh, okay. He's not familiar, Daryl. <laughs> so. Uh, we usually sign off with uh, Daryl's normal sign off. Which is whether you are well. We go. We go on a riff just, a little. Yeah, kind of riff on some random things that we've talked about throughout the episode, and then we wrap it up with the phrase, uh, you know, go orgasm. home, give yourself an orgasm, or better yeah, yet, give, give somebody, somebody else, else one. one. Uh, okay. Yeah. Right. So y- you but ready? I'll, so go home and give. S- <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? This is why he does it, not so. me. <laughs> Glasses on. Oh, okay. He's putting the glasses on. Go home, give yourself an orgasm, or give somebody else one. Yes. <laughs> it was nice to get Hector uh, to help us out with Bring that. Bring him in on that? Yeah, yeah. I got, you know, so clearly, this is a very difficult job, right? Uh, I, I mean, <laughs> I'm not too... Can't just walk in off the street and do the outro. No, no, not at all. You need at least, like, five minutes of prep. Of actual prep time, right? Yeah, yeah. Um. I, I have to say, uh, there's something really rewarding to be at this stage in my career and have an opportunity to sit down and talk about these incredible intellectual thoughts with two brilliant published mm-hmm. doctors. Yes. And, of course, have the conversation devolve into to a Bukaki. conversation about Bukaki. Of, that's, uh, uh, always. That's the life pl- path that I'm on. As Daryl <laughs> said, you know, it always... It, you, it always All roads end, eventually lead to internet book. porn and yeah. Bukaki. Yep, yep. <laughs> You know, I I have to say I really loved spending time with Hector and mm-hmm. um, all the things he had to say, the interesting, you know, information and insights that he had were really great um, and really helped illuminate some of those topics that we talk about often about inequality and um, the way that sex impacts our daily lives that we might not think about too often, but that really is our is our daily life. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I would definitely recommend his books to anybody who's mm-hmm. listening and who's interested in these topics. Uh, I haven't yet read Sex, Power, and Partisanship, but um, Alpha God mm-hmm. was a really easy, really clear way of understanding a lot of these ideas. And uh, I definitely think that it's the type of thing that once you're exposed to it, mm-hmm. it, it kind of on its face is just sort of, meh, okay, I get it. There's not much there. Uh, and then it just sort of shifts your entire perspective on life mm-hmm. by, you know, maybe it's only two degrees, but you'll find yourself for weeks just kind of going, 
Oh, no. that's why I honked at that asshole who cut me off. <laughs> Because somehow that would save me from like orangutans or saber tooth tigers in my evolutionary past. Just those immediate reactions that we have to everyday life and situations that you don't really think about. But when you do think about, you're like, oh. Yeah. And, and specifically, Alpha God talks a lot about uh, just how our society, how our species came to evolve or create religion. Mm-hmm. You know, what uh, emotional need that was filling and you know there's just a part of us that has been subservient to these dominant males for so much of the history of our species that we you know see things like the abrahamic god and we glob onto that and we think oh man this is the you know strength and the protection and the things that i need i was about to say everyone wants protecting yeah and so it uh it's sort of like a way of tricking ourselves into meeting that emotional need and of course we all understand that it's a it's a fallacy and it's a problem right we feel like we're getting our needs met uh but it's a it's a lie that we're telling ourselves and so even as we understand that i think that it can be really useful to recognize what need was that lie trying to fill mm-hmm. you know what was the the function or the purpose of that lie uh that we keep telling each other and why has it pervaded for so long you know um obviously we we talked to hector we also had dr daryl ray and mm-hmm. you know his explanation of the god virus is for my money the most mind-blowing way of looking at and understanding the model for why we allowed religion to be such a part of our our, of our species story yeah how it Mm -hmm. has shaped our history so dramatically for Mm -hmm. so many thousands of years so and um, why we do this show yeah Uh, you know of course uh, we always recommend uh, all of dr ray's books but uh, i would also encourage people that are interested in evolutionary psychology Mm -hmm. and understanding i guess sort of the the function of religion, uh, Alpha God is uh, another great place to look. Well, I am definitely going to be picking it up next time I go to the bookstore. Mm-hmm. And, you know, with that, I just want to say th- uh, another big thank you to uh, Dr. Daryl Ray, of course, as always, mm-hmm. and Dr. Uh, Hector Garcia, who joined us for the episode we aired tonight. And with that, Christy, would you like to take <laughs> us out? <sighs> Let's let's try this one more time. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So you know whether it is your first time, uh-huh. whether it's pre-recorded, mm-hmm. or aired again, uh-huh. <laughs> whether it's part of your you know evolutionary uh, heritage or predisposition, uh-huh. uh huh, or a biological you... urge. Right. Uh, we just want to encourage everybody watching uh, mm-hmm. to go out there and give themselves a, a big old orgasm, or better yet, give, give somebody else, else one. one. Bye.